massive success. This is the Higher Power Radio Show with Rick Gerard. The immigration mess, i.e. immigration 10.142, turning <laughs> away great people due to immigration issues is just tragic. And today we're going to talk about that. Hey, we're going to start with a quote from my friend and yours, Bill Gates. He said, the U.S. immigration laws are bad, really, really bad. I'd say the treatment of immigrants is one of the greatest injustices done in our government's time. I'm Rick Gerard, and this is the How Your Power Radio Show. Our mission is to provide proven tactical solutions to solve your company's toughest hiring challenges. We share insights from top performing entrepreneurs and industry experts like our guest today, Monica Lukacek, who is the immigration attorney for U.S. Immigration Law Group. As a founding partner of the U.S. Immigration Law Group, Monica's practice focuses on employment-based immigration law, assisting businesses in hiring and retaining foreign personnel, and maintaining their immigration compliance programs, assisting entrepreneurs and investors in the United States, and providing advice to employers and employees with all aspects of immigration compliance. So I say she's pretty good at this thing. Monica, welcome to the Higher Power Radio Show today. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we are going to be discussing the current immigration landscape, the changes in policy for 2019, since it's the end of the year, right? we got to cover that stuff. Yes. And then we're going to provide some creative steps to navigate the immigration laws. I'm looking for all the loopholes today. All right, so let's do a quick breakdown on the different kinds of visas. Most of our audience kind of has a familiarization of it, but let's talk about the ones. I mean, we're going to probably focus mainly on H-1Bs, which are the most important one, but um, just run us a, a brief run through on some of the other ones real quick. Sure. I just want to make clear that these visas are not green cards. They're not permanent residents. Sure. They are just um, given for a purpose, a specific purpose, whether it's to work or go to school. So there's a variety of different um, visa categories. One of them is the the treaty trader or treaty investor visa, E1, E2, that allows a person to come to the United States, establish a business, uh, grow that business. There's um, uh, opportunities for people who are intercompany transfers. That means managers or executives of foreign companies who are coming to the company in the United States. Mm -hmm. Most importantly is the H-1B, which is a specialty occupation um, category. And I think it's probably the one that's got the most issues right now yeah. and is most talked about. And the most common are probably the F-1 visa, which is a student practical training visa. Right. Correct? And then you have the H-1B. Right. All right. So, um, and then the TN visa, do you want to... Oh, sure. The TN visa is um, under NAFTA, and, and even though the NAFTA agreement has been renamed and somewhat renegotiated, apparently the immigration aspects of it have not been changed, and um, the TN visa will allow people from Mexico or Canada who have a specific degree to come to the United States to work in enumerated categories of professions. One of them is um, as an accountant, um, as there's different agricultural uh, visas, but they're all at the professional level, bio biologists, that sort of thing. Okay, so these uh, most of these immigration uh, policies took effect when? Oh, well, <laughs> when did the immigration law begin? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the, cur the current ones that we're having to deal with that we're going to talk about today. Okay, so the H-1B visa has been around for uh, a long time before I started practicing law. But in 1990, um, the um, immigration law was changed, the Immigration Act of 1990, and changed how we pr prepare H-1B visas, kind of made it a little stricter and required what's called as a labor uh, condition application, which is an attestation that employers have to make to pay these employees at least the prevailing wage for the occupation, give notice to other employees, and to ensure there's no strike or lockout in the um, workplace. Okay. So that's when that started. In, 2000, in, in 1998, um, there was an addition to that called the Acquia Bill, and that one um, capped the number of H-1B visas al allowed per year. Per year, mm -hmm. which is how many? Well, now it's only 65,000. Or, Out of how many applicants? Okay, we'll get. <laughs> no, but yeah, no, I, I understand. How many people it's... apply every year? Well, last year we had one hundred ninety thousand applications. And Alyssa, so you ha have basically a thirty to forty percent chance of right. getting your H one B. Right. So it's sixty five thousand for the general, and then additional twenty thousand for people who graduated from U S. Masters or Ph D. programs. So it, technically, there's eighty five thousand available. Okay, got it. Now, 
typically the process runs uh, when somebody gets out of school here and they're a foreigner, they get an F-1 visa, which is practical training. Right. And then they have a certain amount of time in which they have to get their H-1B, correct? Okay. So, uh, yes, when people, uh, st foreign students who are studying in the United States graduate from university, they get a minimum of one year optional practical training to help them get work experience in the field that they've selected. If you graduated with a STEM degree, however, you get three years. So you do get the initial 12 months and you can do an extension for an additional 24 months. Okay. During that, that time, and, and I've got to say that most H-1Bs are STEM degree professionals. Yeah. Um, during that time, the employer can choose whether or not to file an H-1B petition to continue to hire this person beyond the three years. Got it. And and that's where we need these people the most, too. Yes. I, I think if... I haven't done a formal study of it, but I believe that most of the people taking these um, STEM uh, courses are foreign students. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of Americans going into the sciences these days, which is kind of scary. Yeah. I, I would like to see that happen more. But I know that there's a huge push in elementary school even for STEM yeah. degree and, and encouraging more women and minorities also to look at those um, those degrees as, an, as a possibility. Yeah, my daughter, who's eight, is in a STEM program. She's is she? Like, yeah, oh, she loves wow. it. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I'm, well, I'm like, great. Well, that's keep, beautiful. Keep moving toward the sciences, yes. Yeah, so I'm happy to hear that. Absolutely. So am I. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking that she was going to follow her father's footsteps, which, you know, hey, she can probably have a podcast and a <laughs> criminal beard. Anyway, <laughs> all right, picture. but I digress. So um, let's talk a little bit about the changes for H-1Bs then. So recently, ever since um, the Buy American, Hire American executive order uh, was passed or was issued uh, April 2018, um, basically what that uh, executive order was intended to do was to ensure that U.S. workers were protected economically <clears throat> and that um, fraud and um, any kind of fraud was detected and prevented in the H-1B field. Also, one of the uh, primary um, reasons for it is to ensure that H-1B workers are only given to, H-1B visas are given to only the highest, most highly skilled and highly paid workers. Sure. So there's a, there's a cap on how much they need to be making? Well, there hasn't been one yet, but or what the executive order bottom, does is it encourages um, the different agencies like the Department of Homeland Security or the Department of Labor to implement policy memos, regulations, operational practices, which would help to ensure that. And we've definitely seen that um, in the past. Um, well, yeah, since it was issued in 2017, we've seen a lot of changes. So it used to be the H-1B transfer, once you have an H-1B and you move to another company, was fairly easy. That's, you just... That still is fairly easy. It's okay. only the cases that are capped. So the 85000 per year. So you once can, you have an H-1B, you're okay? Once you have an H-1B, you can transfer to another employer. It does have some other issues, though, involved with that. Like what? Okay, so if you if you are in an H-1B status and another employer mm -hmm. wants to hire you, the new employer has to file a brand new H-1B petition, but you're not subject to that cap. So okay. that's that's the best part because you're not in that lottery system. But how long does it take to get approved to where that person can move yeah, over? These days, um, the uh, approvals are taking over eight months. Yeah, it used to be premium process processing. It would right. take a few weeks, right? Right. So premium processing used to cost twelve twenty five. It would take two weeks for an adjudication. Adjudication might be also an, uh, not only an approval or a denial, but it could be a request for evidence, which is seeking additional information to prove the person qualifies. Now, uh, premium processing has been suspended by immigration, uh, at least until February. But I wouldn't doubt if there were. I mean, we're <laughs> getting these things on a daily basis. So it'll be abolished by February. <laughs> it, it, you know, and oh, but the, also the fee ra was raised. So from twelve twenty five now it's fourteen ten. Okay. Yeah. Well, for that those extra, who qualify. That extra, you know, um, like ten dollars should make a huge difference. <laughs> All right. Um, so it takes how long? Up to eight months now. Uh, at least eight months. So if an employer is the the issue is that the employee with good reason, doesn't really want to transfer employment until they know for sure that they've been approved. Because they're kind of, you know, it's subject to the employer's whim, really. So what employer wants to wait eight months for an employee, or can wait? I mean, obviously, you can't wait eight months for an employee. But the candidate can leave prior to that and start at the company. Yes, but no, but most, I can tell you from experience that most of those employees don't want to do that. It's not They safe. would rather, yes, yeah. they would rather not leave where they are until they know for sure they've been approved. What, what is the turndown rate, though, on approvals? Uh, well, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> I don't think Just there's... Just nationally, kind of, what do you guys see? I really it? don't 
Yeah, I don't no. know. I have no idea. We don't. We. You guys need a lobbyist. Group. We. Uh, yeah, there is American <laughs> Immigration Lawyers Association in D.C. Very strong law, lobbying group. And we they, don't, use, they don't feed you any of that data. Um, yeah, they do. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, I know in okay. our office we've had good success. So then I sure I should have done my due diligence and looked it up. <laughs> Bad me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, you, you and I were talking to, and you had mentioned that there are some new regulations that have been proposed. So let's talk a little bit about those. Yes. So actually, last week, the Federal Register was published with some new regulations. One of them is for employers, instead of sub preparing and submitting all these applications, which are due April 1st of every year. For the, new h one For new H-1Bs. These are the cap cases. Um, the new regulation is suggesting employers register for a spot. And if you get selected, then you would submit the documentation. Now, this regulation was initially proposed in 2011. Nothing happened with it. Now it's being reopened. In the 2011 regulation, um, it, they were suggesting that the, the, the um, registration period would be only two weeks. So this would essentially stifle um, innovation because you're registering for a spot that you of a may person or may you not. don't have. Yes. So the co large company is going to take these up. Right. Small companies aren't going to be able to do anything with this it. whole this whole system is so um, slanted against small companies. Wow. We, yeah, small companies have a very very hard time with H one Bs. Not only the cost of obtaining the visa, the filing fees alone are twenty mm -hmm. two thousand four hundred sixty. Uh, well, depending on the company uh, size, and attorney's fees are in the few thousands, and the employer is required to pay those fees. The employee may not pay those fees. Now, let's say I'm at UCI, mm -hmm. and I join forces with a couple other students, and we start up a company. Right. Is there a way around it? Can that person stay, or do we have to ship them <laughs> offshore and have them work from there? Well, um you know what? There are Let's hold that real quickly. I just want okay. to do a quick. Um, so if you're just joining us right now on the live stream or the podcast, you're listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Gerard. And today our guest is Monica Lukacek. She's the immigration attorney for the U.S. Immigration Law Group. All right. So I'll let you play. In there. <laughs> OK, so there are some ways around it. Some some people suggest, um, let's say that you're partnering with somebody who is a foreign student and they're going to start a business. You have to create a corporation, which would then be the employer. The foreign student cannot sponsor him or her sure, himself. Sure. So there is a way around that. <clears throat> uh, but again, will they make the cap cut off? Maybe not. If there's and only if a 30 to 40 percent of even getting the h one visa, yeah. who wants to take that risk? The other issue would be um, we talked about stifling entrepreneurship. Uh, first of all, you can't sponsor yourself. And uh, there was, at one point, a proposal for something called the entrepreneur, uh, International Entrepreneur Parole Rule. That's also been um, eliminated by uh -huh. recent memos and regulations. Okay, got it. So if <laughs> essentially, if you're a, a person with money and you want to come in here and start up a company, you can't do that either. If you're a person with money and want to come to the United States, it depends what country you're a citizen of. Yeah. Because I mentioned the, the treaty investor visa. And um, that visa is only available to country, nationals of countries that we have a certain treaty with. Okay. So, for example, we do not have a tr uh, that type of treaty with Russia. We do have it with the Ukraine. We don't have a treaty with China, but we have it with <laughs> Japan, for we have example, one Korea. India? India, no. No, India. Pakistan, that... yes. <laughs> India, no. <laughs> so that... um, Brazil, no. Peru and, uh, Peru and Argentina, yes. So... Um, that's just crazy to me. Okay. So, again, I'm going to go back to the scenario because I think this is kind of it. So, basically, I have the ability to join forces, start up a company. The person will get his practical training visa, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've got, assuming it's a STEM and degree. And that can years. run up to three years. Right. <clears throat> what if it's not a STEM degree? Then they only get one year. Then one year. So, you have one year to process to get an H1 approved. Well, it depends when you got your STEM, your OPT. And when, if you make what that What qualifies cap. as STEM? STEM, well, there's a whole list. It's on the regulatory um, uh, website. But the, you know, pharmacists, anything uh, STEM stands for, science, technology, engineering, and math. Okay. It's been expanded to some um, psychology type, psych, you know, psychiatry and that sort of thing. Um, what if I'm a marketing person? No. Yeah. Not a STEM If degree. I'm a marketing person in technology, that doesn't work. No. Not oh. for an H-1B. Well... It depends on how you prepare the documents and what kind of job they're going to be doing. So if te if a technology degree is required, it's it's better to get a marketing job with a technology degree if that's required. For example, a sales engineer, right? They have to understand the engineering sure. or the, the product in order to sell it. 
Uh, the other way around is much more difficult because marketing. There's most jobs that require a marketing degree. You could also have a business degree. You could have um, you could have an English degree. You could not, you, you don't need, you may not even need a degree, and that's where the H one B also becomes a problem. You have to have a degree that's specialized with that specialty occupation. So that person needs to be a technologist, yes, primarily. Yes, basically, yes. So, and so does the job. So it's yeah. got to match. That's got what it. I love about immigration law. It's such a labyrinth. You start going one way, and then it's like, oh, no, but this is happening. Okay, then let's try this. And so then strategically, you need to list that person as the CTO or the VP of engineering or something to that effect. They can't be a CEO of the company then either. That makes it more difficult, I would imagine, as Very well. Very difficult. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. Welcome right. to my world. <laughs> so uh, you were – okay, so there was a couple other changes, though, that, ha that just went down last week, too. What were they? Um, okay, so one is the registration. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is the proposed <laughs> elimination of work visas for spouses of H-1B visa holders. Yeah, so, because that's usually been an easy – if I have an H-1B, I can actually – my wife can work. If you've been in the United States for more than six years and you're waiting for a green card, then you can apply for a work visa for your spouse. Now, okay. what's the status between – uh, the H-1B and the green card. It's process. a whole different process, but okay. they're often run simultaneously. Yeah. So obviously, if a person is already working here, let's say they're doing really well, and the employer wants to keep them, the employer has the option to um, to sponsor the person for a green card. So H-1Bs are only good for six years. You can do an, uh, a green card application simultaneously, depending on the timing. It's very important. Timing is very important. Um, it depends what country you're from. You could have your green card within two years, because that's how long it's taking to process everything. Probably more than that. Not now. any of my clients. No, but if it's you usually... have an employee who's from India, you're looking at over 10 years. Really? Wait until you get your green card. And in the meantime, you can continue to extend your H-1B. <laughs> There's so. a three-year gap. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then what were the other, the other changes? Um, oh, well, there have been a whole bunch of regulatory, uh, okay. I mean, policy changes. Nothing that really small companies need to be... Um, well, everything affects smaller companies. For example, there's a policy memo that was rescinded. Uh, computer programmers are no longer considered specialty occupations automatically. So really? You, yes. So you have to prove yes, you have to prove that the that the job that's being offered is so complex that only a person with a degree and very specific which is ridiculous because technology. I mean, that's the software industry is huge. Yeah. Well, right? this is programming, so I don't know if. Oh, you're That's talking about more of an computer programming, not software engineering. It. So it's Got a little it. bit different. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are so many different things that are coming down that are just make it harder and harder. It feels like you're in a maze and, and the door is being blocked. And then you go through the other. OK, let's take this route. And the door is being blocked. All right. So how do we navigate this minefield? Um, how do we navigate if it? I'm well, a, if I'm a small company and I've, I'm kind of I'm considering somebody. Yeah. What, what do I need to do first? Like, how do I need to cover myself? How do I need to know that I don't invest a whole lot of time into somebody that in and won't come over? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say don't do it on your own. I mean, you really do need to have an attorney walk you through it. Um, I have um, helped somebody who they did the initial part on, the, on their own, and their case was um, the Immigration Service requested additional evidence. Uh, that now has been changed. Also, another policy memo that if a person does not submit all the basic requirements for the application, the case will be automatically denied and the individual be re could be referred to um, the deportation um, authority. So a notice to, uh, to appear might be issued. Oh, so if you screw up, you'll get deported now. If you cannot show the basic uh, regulatory <clears throat> eligibility, yes. Oh, my God. And there's so much with, with an H-1B. You have to do a labor condition application. And I would imagine these policies are just changing on a daily basis. They Feel like they are. Yeah. Yeah, they feel like they are. Okay. So what are some creative solutions to get past this? I mean, let, so yeah. there must be some ways around this. I've got somebody. I need to hire them. I need this person because this is the person who's going to help my company succeed. Right. How do I get around it? Okay. So uh, if, if the timing mm. works, which, again, I may not. For example, we talked about OPT. OPT. Um, yeah, you know me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm down with OPT. OPT. So anyway, OPT is optional practical training. Got and um, the individual, if their OPT expires, let's say, in February, and the filing date that you can actually file isn't until April, they've got that huge gap. Now, they have 60 days to leave the U.S., but they can't be working in the interim. Even if their H-1B gets selected in the lottery, they cannot start working. And in it's taking more than eight months to process these cases. So even though they are technically requesting to start working October 1st 
I've got some cases I filed last April that are still pending. Can they go to Canada or Mexico? Oh and well, go work yeah, from if, there? yeah, sure. If they get job offers from, uh, uh, and can that's work, what a lot of people are doing. Can they work doing. for your company here in? Canada? If they are physically outside of the United States, and um, then there's no reach, there's no extraterritorial reach of the immigration laws. So yes, if they're outside of the United States, they could work. Yeah. They can do whatever they want, but. How realistic I, is that? I'm thinking we need to start up an incubator down in Tijuana. Well, a lot of companies have. <laughs> and actually, Chile, <laughs> from what I understand, the country of Chile is offering, I think, $40,000 um, to people who want to start incubators in Chile. They'll give you $40,000 to start your business there. There are a lot of very highly educated um, technology um, students there. What about using a third-party firm? Um, okay, so, so there's there are policy memos regarding that as well. You, there, by law, you have to show, or by regulation, you have to show that there's an itinerary for the person who's going to be uh, working off. You know, the petitioner is the third party, mm. right? Yeah. And so, the, saying I'm going to uh, place you at your location, well, you have to show that there's enough work to keep that person busy. There's an itinerary. They're being directed by the petitioner, not by where your person is sitting. So. That becomes a little bit murky because if a person sitting, let's say, at a, a developing software at a technology company, but they're really only um, being managed by someone who is their employer, which is not sitting there with them, who's really managing that employee? It's really important to show direct uh, reporting uh, with the petitioner, not with where the person is sitting and doing the work. So if you're running through a third-party firm and I've got a person who is essentially going to be one of the key people in my organization. Mm -hmm. Can't they sponsor their H1, go through the whole process? I mean, I'm sure it's going to be more costly. Can't they run through them as a on a business visa? No, there is no other visa. The business visa does not allow people to work in the U.S. That's one we didn't talk about. Well, but if, if uh, there's an organization that's located in, in India and they uh -huh. bring people over here to they work on They need H1Bs. They need H1Bs. Yes, there's been a lot of fraud in that situation. In fact, ah. some companies have already been paying millions of dollars in fines for doing that illegally so Woo. yeah all right so <laughs> sorry guys Not we don't have a whole lot of good options for you except for move to tijuana or hopefully, canada <laughs> hopefully canada or tijuana have a couple we works or something like that tech spaces all right we're just about out of time for today's show monica thank you so much for your time investment today and i want to welcome you to the higher power radio community um, now, I'm sure some of our listeners would like to, could use your services or sure. would like to find out more about you. How do they reach you? Um, my email address would be the best way to reach me. Um, it's, right. I'm yeah. sure it's it's somewhere here. But no, no, go ahead and okay, say it. Okay, it's monica at usilg.net, and my phone number is 949-480-9345. That's my direct line. And it's monica, M-O-N-I-C-A. Yes, thank you. Perfect. All right, I want to thank our listening audience to tuning in this week's episode of Higher Power. A quick thanks to our team, our engineer, Paul Roberts, our creative director, Ayla Gerard, our producers, Andrea Ballon and Shanti Ryle. If you're listening to podcasts, please subscribe, rate, and review. We need your feedback to bring more valuable content to you. You can join our Higher Power radio community at Higher, that's H-I-R-E, Power, P-O-W-E-R, radio.com. And you can find us on all the various uh Web platforms. I don't know why I always mess up this part. iHeartRadio, Stitcher, <laughs> TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube. Or follow me on Instagram at RickGerard1. Tune in next week. Our guest is going to be Sang Nguyen. Sang is the former COO of Tint or TintUp.com. I'm your host, Rick Gerard, and you have been listening to the Higher Power Radio Show. Aloha. Thank you for listening to Higher Power with Rick Gerard on OC Talk Radio.